Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 10 of Dream Big and Live Free. I'm your host, Savvy Barrows. Please remember to subscribe to my podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Also, follow me on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook at Savvy Barrows and message me and let me know what you think about the show. This week, I brought Dr. Jenny Rankin to share some insights on how to ignore the naysayers and go on to achieve your goals and live your dreams. Jenny is a Fulbright specialist for the US Department of State who previously taught the postdoc masterclass at the University of Cambridge in England as a visiting lecturer. She has appeared countless times in the media, and you may know about her from some of her appearances in the Huffington Post, NPR, and the Oprah Magazine, just to name a few. Jenny has also given over 200 keynotes in eight countries and written 12 books, 150 papers and articles, and has appeared in 38 different publications. And when Jenny's not speaking, she is living her best life in Laguna Beach, California, one of my favorite places. And she's writing books relating to data, relating to data education, teacher burnout, gifted education, and sharing her research and expertise with the world. Jenny, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you today. Thanks so much for having me. It's such a great, just such a great chance to share. And I, I love spending time with you as well. Awesome. So Jenny, you have an incredible background. Like you're so impressive. But what I want you to share today is all of the work <laughs> that you had to do and how also you found the strength to overcome some of the life challenges that you were facing as you were starting as as you had to constantly do <laughs> as you found your way in life. So maybe a good place to start today is really at the beginning. You know, can you share a little bit about your your childhood and some of the things that you experienced? Sure. I I was very blessed with wonderful parents. I really um okay got fantastic parents. Um, but I did have a, an abusive family member. Um, and there were some things that were difficult about my childhood. And as we know, whatever happens when you're a kid affects you um, in ways that you're having to constantly, very carefully and very consciously try to work around as an adult. You know, you think, oh, well, this is why I have put up with that, or this is why I'm drawn to that or you know what whatever it is and so um so it definitely set me up for a relationships where i was giving but i wasn't treated very well in return mm -hmm. um so so it, there was that but then i also had the positivity of my parents it was a it's a it was a funny um dynamic mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's a that sounds like a pretty challenging situation. So, I mean, I've shared on my podcast before that I grew up in a in an abusive family. I certainly had my own challenges with that. So, I, I can relate to what it is like as you know a young person because really the world that you're living in as as a child and even even a you know a young person that's all you know, right? Your point of reference is one data point. You think those things are normal. And so, yeah. um, you know, but I think that there's something about the voice inside of us, you know, whether you want to call it your higher power, your universe, whatever you believe in, we somehow always have this North star that guides us. And for you, it was guiding you towards your academics. So, I know that um, you know a lot of this stuff happened a while ago, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that you can think about. You know, and we'll switch to your um, your your beginning of your educational career. We can call it that. Just how was it that you think you were able to kind of overcome some of those situations that you were going through while you were pursuing your your education, and I want to get into that in a little bit also about all the things you've done there. 
Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I had my, my parents were very sweet and I, I was definitely raised, always think of the other person, always, you know, give the shirt off your back to whoever. I, I wasn't raised to look out for myself. Um, and, and then when you do try that on, you know, that, okay, I'm being mistreated and I, I need to look, it's, it's very awkward because it's not something you're used to um, when, when you're raised that way. But, but even though I had that going on, I had such positive parents and I know my, my dad, and there's, there's a lot of research behind the fact that it, kids that grow up with trauma and abuse, if, if there's just one, it just takes one adult, there's just one voice that, that they can latch onto, that that can propel them through really hard times. And my dad always had this enthusiasm about him. Like if I were to say, I'm, go I'm going to be president, he would say, if of course you are and let's plan your campaign it was like there was no limit you know and so it was this funny you know we all have different voices in our lives you know and so there are the voices that kind of teach us to hang back or to put up with things but but then there's the pull of these other voices that are something very positive and i know i know for me i i would be in these situations but i would think well, wait, I should do that. I can do that. And there were lots of times in my life where I took big leaps. Uh, like when I was, I was a teacher and then I became a, I was a junior high school English teacher and I uh, became a teacher on special assignment where I was doing lots of administrative stuff with other colleagues and training them and, and doing all sorts of things that I just loved. And we had a new principal coming on. Um, and I had loved working with my principal. She and I are both, you know, we talk about minute and we're, you know, and, and I, I just thought, you know, I, I'm not going to like what's, ha I felt like it wasn't going to be the same thing. I felt like I wasn't going to be having the same impact on the kids as this wonderful principal had, you know, she just gave me full reign. And so, um, they tried to lock me into the contract to keep me to stay, but I gave my notice and I had no job lined up. I had just, you know, broken up with a, a, from a serious relationship and I had my mortgage. I bought a home, you know, I have a mortgage, no job lined up. And I didn't even have an administrative credential. I was a teacher doing administrative stuff. I didn't even have an administrative credential, but I said, you know what? I don't want there to be, a, I felt like there was going to be a limit on me on what I was called to do. So I said, I'm going to be an assistant principal. And it must have been March, April. I mean, there's, there's no, schools are already doing their hiring for the next year, but I just, I gave my notice. I insisted, you know, I got out of that, you know, I was not going to be there that next year. No job lined up. And sometimes we just have to take that jump. Like, you know, but it's going to be okay. I'm, I'm going to make it okay. I'm going to make this happen. And I took an online, everyone I knew failed it because it's really rigorous test to get your admin credential. And then you later have to do schooling, but it was a way to get it at the, at the front, you know, um, and then interviewed and I got this job where I was, I mean, I was worked to the bone in a super tough school, but that's where I wanted to be. I, I felt like I was making a difference. And, um, and it's, yeah, there's, there are just times where it was so easy to listen to voices that are like, mm, no, play it safe. You've got your job, but you just have to pick out that, that voice inside. That's just saying, you know, whoever, put, you know, where that, wherever that voice came from that's saying, no, do it, take the jump, go and, and, and make it happen. You know, you can't just blindly jump and not do anything. You definitely have to hit the pavement and hustle and make it happen. But, but if you do those two things together, you know, and, and that, that got me through a lot of things. That's what, that's what carried me all the way to the top. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's an, that's amazing. So you know, sometimes I think that when people say things like believe in yourself, take the lead, yeah. you know, you know uh, focus on the positive things, people will often think that, oh, that's so like, you know, that's like pish posh, you know, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's like, that. yeah, it's like, don't tell me that that's so simple, but it's, it's actually, it sounds simple. It's pretty difficult to execute because it's really about 
um, changing your mindset to believing that you can create the world that you want to create, even out of the most desperate situation. And then that's the point of this podcast is to really inspire people to take action, even when, especially when things aren't perfect. And you're such yeah. a great exa example of that, just all of the things that you had to come through. But, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the beginning of your, of your college years. So, um, you know, I think you shared that you you did very well in college. You always were really into academics and pretty focused in that world. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. I, I was an art major because most of my scholarships, I went to college on scholarships and most were art scholarships and they required that I be taking a certain load of art classes. And I, um, and I do, I love art, um, but I, so I ended up an art major and my parents, oh, that's great. You know, so many parents would say, no, that, you know, oh, what are you going to do? Like, like, what are you going to do with your life with art stuff? <laughs> yeah, but it's so cute. They're just, yay, you know, like, <laughs> go do it. And I, I didn't have a plan with what I was going to do with it. I was a very, um, I, I'm on the naive side a lot, you know, on, um, or was at least, at least in those early years. But I do think, when, if you're just always following passions, you tend to do okay. And I, and I was obviously very passionate about art. And it's funny how design has come up in other things that I'm doing, you know, it, it, it has helped along the way. Um, but then I didn't know what I was going to do. Moved to Scotland for a year and I, I always taught aerobics on the side. So I taught aerobics. I attended bar at night, which was hilarious because I, I, I know nothing about bartending. Um, so had an adventure, you know, and came back and did more of the fitness stuff. But I've always loved teaching. Even, even when I was 12, 13 years old, I volunteered at the library and they'd have me working with the kids and doing little classes. And I, I just always loved teaching. And so I started subbing, you know, in the school districts and um, then went and started teaching. And um, absolutely loved it. And it's funny, I was never, I was never looking to climb the ladder, but my principal gave me that, that opportunity to be a teacher on special assignment where I'm training colleagues and, you know, and I, and then I got to do all that administrative stuff. And I, I just loved it. And I felt my impact growing. I felt like, Hey, instead of just the kids in my classroom, now it's the school. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I took that leap to then be assistant principal because I, I wanted to keep doing that. And then from there, took another leap and there's a whole story behind that too, but I ended up a district administrator and then I was affecting whole school district. And, wow. um, and I was really just trying to have that impact. And then while I was in these roles, I saw, I, I had a specialty of data use, but I saw that most people were misunderstanding data and misusing data and then making decisions that impact kids' lives, which is, heartbreaking. Um, in this country, even at districts that have the best training for teachers available on data use, they're still only comprehending about 48% of the data and, and not even knowing what they're not understanding. And, and the huge culprit is the way data is communicated. It's horrible, right? Because teachers are smart people and they care so much. So it's, I, the onus isn't on them. It's, it's these data systems. So I started studying how can we make this easier on educators that this that will then, you know, be able to better help students. And so I had another obstacle in my life. I had done all this schooling to get my teaching credential and my admin credential. And I was on, I had there was a certain track at my college if you wanted to also be getting your math, if you wanted to also count towards a master's degree. And it's, it's no additional classes. It's just you have to be labeled as being on a certain track. And the university said, well, your advisor never put that in, you know, at, at the tail end of this, when I'm like, okay, I just have to take a couple more classes and I have my master's, right? I have all these credits. And they're like, oh, you're not on that track. And I even had the email of the correspondence with my advisor about please put me on the track and they wouldn't honor it. And oh. I felt so wronged and I, I had done all this schooling to not have my master's. But when you get your PhD, it's just the credits they, they care about. It's, you don't have to have, you know, so I essentially had the master's. I just didn't have, so I thought well, I've done all this schooling. I'm like, 
why not go all the way? I'm, I'm going to go and get my PhD. And I was also so passionate about improving these data systems so that data use became easier. And so I just started all the work I was doing on that. I, I just folded into a dissertation and, and it was crazy. I, I met my hus that husband, um, I mean, I'd gotten into the program and then I met him right before my start date. And then we got married within a few months and we tried immediately for kids because I'm an older mom and got pregnant right away. And so I was working a full-time job. We started a business together and, and a data systems company, right? You know, upon getting married. And I, then I had this new baby and, and it was insane. It was absolutely insane. Um, but I just kept thinking, you know, I'm going to turn 40 no matter what. And I can either turn 40 and have my PhD or turn 40 and not have my PhD. You know, it's still going to happen. And I, I heard that once in an interview with a woman who was 100 getting her bachelor's degree. And she said, well, wow. I'm turning 100 no matter what. I can, you know, um, so it was, it was pretty insane. But then pretty soon I had my PhD. And then ultimately I got a, another doctorate, an honorary LHD. Um, there at University of Laverne, they defended on my behalf, my life's work, which made me feel old, you know, life's work. <laughs> you know, but they're just, it's such a spectacular university with such an amazing team. And, and I was so honored. And, and so that's added to that as well. And, um, and get to do all these exciting things, having, having your doctorate open so many doors. I mean, I never would be able to lecture at Cambridge if I didn't have my, at least one doctorate, you know, mm -hmm. so um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so for everyone, if you really like Sewell or if you, you know, get liking it, because PhD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, Easy, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's like going through a, you know, fast food drive through Let's, let's yeah. all just do it. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit, but, um, <laughs> yeah, you're making it seem way too easy. But, uh, you know, the other thing that I'd like for you to share is, you know, as much as you, you'd like to, is even through this process or what you had shared with me was that you had a naysayer about getting your PhD that was pretty close to you, which yeah. was actually someone you were married to. Yes. So yes. I have actually been in that situation before where I, I've experienced something very similar when I was married. Um, and that's a pretty tough thing when you're trying to, um, you know, you're in this relationship, but you're trying to be your own person, right? Which should be totally normal. You should be able to go after your goal. You should be able to, to, to pursue things that matter to you, but yeah. you experience something similar. So can you share a little bit about you know, that experience and how you manage to kind of navigate that? Because I know that um, this is something that's unfortunately pretty common for women. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I was, um, I had I either just finished my doctorate or I was, I was at least near the end of my dissertation. And I thought, you know, I don't want it just to sit in a journal or sit behind a paywall. You know, it was going to sit behind a paywall because that won't impact lives. I want my findings to help students ultimately. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write some books. And so I was working on the books, uh, mainly the, you know, the first is a series, um, but mainly the first one working on and I was so excited and I and, and my husband was the same field you know so it's to talk about it was talking about somebody that was in this as well and I was so excited and it was bothering him and and he said you know why and then one time I remember it very clearly because we were on an airplane and it was Valentine's Day <laughs> and he said why are you even working on that and he said nobody's going to publish that. No, you're wasting your time. Nobody's going to publish that. You're a nobody. And it would be really easy for me, particularly coming from abuse and even in that relationship, experiencing abuse. And it would be easy to grab onto those voices that you do have in life that tell you to, um, you know, step back, 
don't speak up, don't try, don't put yourself out there, don't try to sit at the table. Um, but something that was really cool is that for me, my findings could help students on a, on a massive scale. And for anybody, it doesn't matter your field, whatever you have, whatever somebody has that they can share with the world that can help somebody out or make a difference or make life easier for somebody, whatever it is, it, it's, it's, I think helpful to think of it, it's not just about you, right? If it was just about me, like I want to write a, I want to write books to have my name on books, you know? Okay, that's that there's not too much reason to follow that path. But if you look at whatever you have to share and how that can benefit others, it can help you step up. Because often we won't speak up for ourselves, but we will for others. You know, we we will do, you know anything if someone else is being mistreated. So I thought to myself, I, I thought like the movie Dirty Dancing where Patrick Swayze goes and goes up to Jennifer Craig, you know, he says, nobody puts baby in a corner and she steps out and they have this big dance and it's just like an amazing moment. And, and all, it, all of it happened because she was willing to get out of that comfort zone, you know, and not sit in that corner. And so I, I thought more along those lines and I was thinking, nobody knows this information I found. I, I have to get this out there. And so I just, whatever he said, I just tuned it out and I got it very quickly. I got it published, um, in fact, and, and, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't, I mean, I just blindly mailed it off, you know, in the traditional way. And, um, and that was about six years ago and my 12th book just came out. And so if I had listened to him, that's two books a year that I wouldn't have out there and that wouldn't be helping those who read them and then helping those, that those people help and so on. Um, just by thinking, thinking about, no, I have something to share and this can better people. And so I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to focus on that. Yeah. So that's, that's an incredible story because it really seems that what you were able to do, even just kind of tracking back to your early education years is that, you know, you had a, you, it started off with a bright spark, right? Your father who helped you to, to believe that you could do whatever it is that you wanted to do. And then when it came to your PhD, what you did was you thought about the impact of the world. You thought about the impact of the information and how just important it was and how much people really needed to hear your message to improve their own lives. So it seemed that because you had a much bigger goal than something that was just for your own self, it allowed you to kind of shake off that um, feeling of not being supported um, and allowed you to, to keep focus on your North Star. Yeah, for, for sure. And there, there's so much research too tying in a sense of purpose with happiness. You know, when people fall into deep depressions, I mean, for a variety of reasons, you know, depression's a, a, tough, a tough one, but, but many people who are falling into deep depressions, it's tied in with not having a purpose and something that they're, they're following with passion. And it's amazing, even when you're stressed out of your mind to accomplish something because it's too much and you don't have enough time, you don't, it's funny how you can find yourself happier than if you had more time on your hands and, you know, time to, you know, maybe make my hair look better today or, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> you know, it's because you're, you're following this, this bigger purpose. Yeah. So I, I, I want to talk about this notion of purpose for a second, because it's something that's pretty important to me. And it's also one of the things that I'll be teaching women in my workshops, which is pretty much how to find your, your purpose and your passion. So, um, you know, from my opinion, the way that you find your passion is you almost have to take a very realistic look at where you are today in order to figure out where the future is. And yes. so the purpose is a very honest, non-judgmental inventory of, okay, where is really my baseline? And then looking at the future, it's kind of where you wanna go to. And then that delta is really the work that you need to do in yes. order 
to get to uh, your your goal, you know, your your purpose. So mm-hmm. this is how I think about it. Do you want to share some thoughts around that? I love that that's how you teach it to people because it, if we don't take that honest assessment of where we're at right now, the goal remains unreachable because the whole way you get to the goal is one foot in front of the other in the right way, right? And the, you know, doing the right things and taking care of the, you know, sometimes when people have a dream and I, and I get this, I mean, I fully get this. They'll want to like, let's say they want to open a restaurant, you know, they want to plan menus and, you know, maybe design sketch and, you know, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, you know, <laughs> there's, there's some other stuff that has to happen first. And, you know, you really do have to break it down into those manageable steps. And then not only does it stop being overwhelming when you do that, but it actually becomes achievable because that's all anyone's done who's gotten to these high heights is just one foot in front of the other. But yeah, it, it's, you definitely have to take a look at that first. And then it also allows you to see, you know, it seems so unreachable, but it allows you to see, oh, wait a second, no, there's a path. You know, I can see just a little path right here and, you know, clear these weeds around and take these little steps and, and it might meander a little bit, but, I, but I'll get there, you know, um, if, if you stop and, and think about the way. I love that. Yeah, yeah, exactly what you're saying. And, and I think we're, I think what you're saying is like, don't worry about the how. It's like, if you understand your baseline and where the goal is, the stuff in between, it doesn't doesn't necessarily matter as long as you know the steps you need to take to go on that journey. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because there's going to be surprises anyway. You know, you have the best laid plans, things are going to come up anyway. But yeah, as long as you work out some key steps and you and and keep reassessing as you go too, you know, you'll find new new needs and new things to do. Yeah. And you and your own life is very much a, a reflection of that because I mean, before you were this um, sort of media star. I mean, my goodness, the amount of media things you've done and things you've published has been really impressive. But you just a little bit earlier were sharing about, you know, how you you were teaching and then you were doing something else and then something else, but you always stayed true to your trajectory of where you wanted to go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's and always following your passion. Yeah, because you look art major, English, high, you know, junior high school English teacher. How you know how does that land in academia? How does that land in authorship and so on? But yeah, you're you're just you're always thinking. How can I push myself? How can I give more? Be more? Do more? And um, make a bigger difference? You know, everyone wants to have an impact on the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree and, and, and I feel the same. Like, so that's why my mission is to empower 1 million women. It seems like an amazing life goal and I love that. <laughs> oh, I love it, I love it. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the new book? Oh, sure, oh, you're so kind. Can I even just sheer coincidence <laughs> sheer coincidence. Um, I just got my big box. You know, they sell you a big box. Uh, but, it, but this is my latest one. It's Increasing the Impact of Your Research, a Practical Guide to Sharing Your Findings and Widening Your Reach. And it's, um, it's field agnostic. So it's for someone in any field. And um, when I say research, it can be in the traditional you know, they work at a university kind of researcher, but it can also be at home online. You're just doing your thing and finding out information kind of researcher. Um, But it's how to get it out there because research notoriously sits in one spot and the researcher says, oh, I did it, you know, it's done. Um, But if you really want to have an impact with whatever your knowledge is, you have to get it out into the world. So it's it's how to get in the media, how to, um, you know, how to get on NPR, how to give a TED talk, how to do it there. I mean, there's tons of um, public speaking opportunities. There are great databases. There are a lot too that are dedicated to increasing diversity in, in these various realms as well. Um, databases that are just speakers who are women or of color and so on, or LGBT plus. And, um, and the same thing for, um, you know, media opportunities and, and writing and, um, you know, pitching journalists, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it covers how to actually do it too. Like, 
you're writing a book, you're writing an article, what are some key things to, to look out for? Um, so it's really just what I'm passionate about. As, as I was sharing my research and um, I just found a lot of other people wanted to do the same but didn't know where to start because they're so busy, you know, with, with their research and, and whatever their jobs are and their careers are so busy. Um, and so I was often just helping people out in this area. And so pretty soon I started teaching classes about this. Um, that's, that's basically what I was, you know, a big chunk of what I was teaching at Cambridge is how to, you know, communicate those findings and get those out there. Um, awesome. so it's something I'm really passionate about. Amazing. That's awesome. So, um, how can people get in touch with you? Is Twitter the best place? What's the best place? Twitter is fantastic. Yeah, I'm on Twitter probably the most out of all of social media at um, at Ginny G Rankin, I believe it is. Um, I, sh I should know that. <laughs> okay, we'll make sure to uh, put your link in the show notes oh, for anyone listening to the show today. Just go to the show notes and uh, you'll see Jenny's Twitter handle where you can reach out to her. And um, so just to, to wrap up, Jenny, so... Um, I always like to make sure that we leave our listeners with three tips. So can you give three tips on how to, uh, three tips for people to overcome the naysayers, whether it's another person in their life, or maybe it's even in their own head. What are three tips that you would share? Um, one is to analyze the criticisms uh, because sometimes we hear some good points in there. And so it's easy to just think, oh, this person knows what he or she is talking about and just wipe our whole idea aside or, or just step back entirely. But if we break it apart and we pull out, there might be some really valid exceptional points that can, that can help us, you know, maybe adjust our our steps a little bit or whatever it is we're going to do things to look out for. So we want it, we do want to pull the good out of it, but we also in analyzing it want to figure out, you know, mm, I think maybe some of this is the baggage of the person saying it, or I think maybe this person's worried about losing me, or maybe this person, you know, doesn't want to see me rise above him or whatever it is. Um, so when we analyze it, it, it makes it less, um, less crushing and more helpful. You know, it suddenly can become a little helpful to pull out the good um, and then know why we're discarding the rest. Uh, so that would be one, analyzing it. Another one would be, we have all those voices in our lives and we've got the negative ones, um, but to pick out, just find somebody positive in your life. And, and sometimes for like kids growing up in tough situations, sometimes it's a celebrity it's not even anybody that they know and they just read everything that person writes and watch every interview and you know or, or watch podcasts and so on you know, you you find a voice that you can grab onto and just start making a, a an effort to listen to that voice when you find yourself discouraged think well what would that person tell me what would that person say um so finding those positive voices and then the last one has to do with um you know we often say surround yourself with positive people and that's good but i want to say be super intentional about it and and really build around you a network and and not a one-way network not these people are just going to help me achieve my dreams uh, but a two-way, you know, people where we're going to just lift one another up. Um, Cheryl Sandberg writes about this in Lean In, about two women at some Fortune 500 company. They know that, you know, women, when we speak up about ourselves, we're often judged too harshly, like we're being arrogant when a man could say it and no one would think twice. But these two women would each point out the wonderful things that the other person was doing and they rose to the top and then once they were executives they could then make it a different environment for those coming after and make sure that all voices are heard uh, no matter you know race gender ethnicity and so on um, and so I, I think when you find people in your life where you can partner up, forge a mastermind, you know, meet whatever it is, even if it's every other month in a quick call, what can I help you with? What are you doing? Um, send each other opportunities. Um, and you make it that two way positive relationship in a really intentional way that can take you really far. Yeah, that's, that's amazing advice. So it's almost like, um, it, it, you know, the vision I get is building a bridge together, right? But from, yes. right, from the opposite side. That's great. 
That's, yeah. that's amazing. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for those three tips. And thank you so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed having you. Oh, thank you so much. It was such an honor. This is such a joy. And, um, and I just, I look forward to watching all your podcasts. <laughs> thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. And thanks again, friends, for listening to this week's episode. Please remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Follow me at Savvy Barrows on LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and message me and let me know what you think about the show. Thanks again, friends. Until next week. <laughs>